Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk from Jerusalem, Israel. Rabbi Chaim Richman here together in the studio with Yitzhak Ruvain. Today is the 10th day of the month of Tammuz, 5777. It is July 4th, 2017. And this week's Torah portion, Torah portion of Balak, when all else fails against the Jews, Try cursing them. It's easy and fun. That's what this week's Torah portion is all about. A lot of that going around in the world as well. Yitzhak Ruven, how was it the past couple of weeks doing Temple Talk without me? Did you spread well, your wings? I, uh, not only did I miss you, Rabbi, but I'm sure the audience, uh, our listeners, missed, missed you uh, a hundredfold because I just... Well, you listen to me for 45 minutes? Come on. Even I don't listen to me for 45 minutes. Oh, I'm sure it was great. But I'm very, uh, very happy to be back But you didn't Holy listen Land. to me, so you wouldn't know. I was busy. I was traveling. <laughs> yeah. I was busy. Yeah, I get that, but uh, I can't blame you. I'm so happy you're back there. Yitzchak, you so and I, happy. I think we made Aliyah around the same time. I, I uh, made Aliyah to the land of Israel. That means going up, ascending in the year 1982. How no. about you? What about me? How about you? Well, I actually have been here since 81. Official Aliyah was in, was March 1st, 84. And then it was a fateful uh, army service in 1989, I think, when yeah, we what's met. Yeah, what's with the reminiscing? What's Even with though the I started the army nostalgia. in 1987, I think the first... I what's think with the, the first, stroll down I'll tell you in a minute. Yeah. But the first time we met in the army was 89. The reminiscence is because... Parshat... Balak? No. no. <laughs> the reminiscence is because today is July 4th, and I want to wish all of our American listeners a happy 4th of July, a happy Independence Day. I want to um, remember um, those heady days of uh, Aliyah because I just read a beautiful story that today, on the 4th of July, 201 immigrants from North America, that is America and Canada, Move to Israel today. What a Fourth of July present. Hmm. And uh, ain't that beautiful? Well, you know what? I remember the Fourth of July, 1976. I knew you were going to say that. Yes, it's, uh, it is something that it, it sticks out in my mind yeah. that bicent- bicentennial year when the with the tall ships, tall ships and, and um, the whole um, celebration of America's bicentennial that was the day of the rescue from Entebbe. Mm-hmm. And that most beautiful, incredible, un, unparalleled, daring act of, of um, Israel sending fighter jets and commandos under the radar for thousands of miles to rescue some Jews that had been kidnapped, hijacked, and how that was um, acknowledged even in many editorials as being such a beautiful present that Israel gave to America on Independence Day, its Independence Day, meaning the true definition, example, of what uh, freedom really is all about, and I'm fighting for freedom. freedom, So, before I say anything else about Parshat Balak, I recall the anecdote of the famed Aptarav, uh-huh. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, you make these faces like you're. Are you sick of my material? No, no. I, this is a this is one of my. This is just happens to be one of my favorite things in the world. This is the best. About how the Aptarov, who was a student of the Baal Shem Tov, holy Baal Shem Tov, Rabbi Svarlo Apt was the name of the city that he lived in. He was known for um, always. Um, expounding everything in the Torah along the lines of the uh, preeminence of the commandments and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he always was like looking for examples even between the lines and even like couched, you know, in other, in, in other levels of meaning of, of, of loving, of loving another, loving your fellow man. Um, th- th- everywhere throughout the Torah. So his students said to him kind of like tongue-in-cheek, kind of like whimsically, kind of maybe half sarcastically, oh, Rebbe, I don't suppose you could find an example of in Parshat Balak. 
because Pasha Balak is a pretty is pretty severe. <laughs> you know, it's about yeah. this this alliance between these, uh, these very evil people, the heathen king Balak and the heathen prophet Bilam, all about cursing the Jewish people. So they said to him, "Our master, where could you find an example of the Ahavta Larecha Kamocha and you shall love your neighbor as yourself in the Torah portion of Balak, which of and course begins in the Book of Numbers, chapter twenty-two. And verse 2, and he said... It's easy. What do you mean? It's easy. It's the easiest thing of all. It's the easiest example in the whole Torah. Say what? Balak is the letters, V'ahavta l'reacha kamocha, meaning he was saying that the word Balak, uh, who was, of course, the king of uh, Moab, Moab, he... Uh, that word is spelled bet lamed kuf, why he said Balak? That's Ahav Talareacha Kamocha. That's an acronym of the three words, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself in the book of Leviticus. And they looked at him like he was crazy. And they said, Excuse us, our master, but Ahav Talareacha Kamocha is spelled Vav Lamid Chaf, right? Ahav Talareacha Kamocha, Vav Lamid Kaf. And here, it's bet lamed kuf. It's not at all the same letters. It just phonetically sounds the same way, but it's not at all the same letters. So they and he knows that. So they said, like, what are you talking about? Joking, joking with me, pulling my leg. And he said, in his tremendous wisdom, he said, no, you don't get it. When it comes to loving your neighbor as yourself, you don't, don't be overly picky. Make don't, allowances. Don't be right. Don't be overly strict about like, the words <laughs> like like don't be don't be so literal don't be don't be literal be large right which is a very very beautiful idea um but i think that there's much 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 more to it than r- meets the eye because sometimes we hear an anecdote like this from the great rabbis and we think it's like oh it's very whimsical it's very beautiful it's very folksy. nostalgic romantic folksy right yeah it's just that but actually each each time that you hear a story like that from the great masters there is a deep lesson that's penetrating, and that, and the one here is that the antidote to this type of assault on the people of Israel, mm-hmm. the antidote, the the protection, the the um, circumvention, the iron dome, if you will, <laughs> against the uh, terrible attack of a of a Bilam and a Balak is our love for each other. I'll tell you why this is actually quite apropos, this discussion right now, because there's a lot of acrimony, and there's a lot of, I don't know, bad feelings, ill will, misunderstanding going on between Israel and its policies and, and communities in the diaspora regarding things like who's going to be in charge at the Western Wall, who's going to lead the prayer services, are they going to be egalitarian, could they be mixed gender and all sorts of issues that are traditionally reflective of of Israel's um, commitment to uh, a certain religious standard, and then there are Jewish communities that are offended by that and say no, it has to be uh, adopted, changed for you know for to be inclusive of everybody. Now some of these groups actually are sincere and some of them, certainly individuals are, but some groups I know they have a certain kind of politicized agenda and that's offensive to me that they would kind of use carrot and stick kind of thing with Israel like well if you want us to support Israel then we have to, then you have to be, you know, like recognize our priorities. But in any event the point is, you know what, I personally think that it is very, very important that all Jews of all denominations, stripes, and um, leanings uh, and persuasions are made to feel that this is their home, that, th- that they are included, that they are embraced, that they are welcomed. That's got nothing to do with um, uprooting what the Torah teaches or uprooting what's held the Jewish people at, together at the glue, at the seams for 2,000 years, which of course is the way of life of the Torah. But as far as you know, mm-hmm. as far as this idea of loving your neighbor as yourself and being inclusive, we must find ways of reaching out to all Jews and making them understand how important it is for us to be one nation. And as you pointed out, that that lesson that you taught us teaches us exactly how to reach out by being a little less 
a little oh. less insistent on our way and a little more expansive, a little more flexible. And not being like picayune about these details. So, so you're spelling it's not it wrong. spelled that way. Right. <laughs> What's the big deal? So you agree with me that this is actually a very deep lesson of what the, what the yeah. rabbis are trying to say with that story is like, you know what? When it comes to loving your fellow man, don't do it on your terms. Don't do it f with your agenda. Don't do it um, with your with your uh, uh, by holding them up according to your right. standard. And and in the story of the parasha of Balak and Bilam, literally, the words that left Bilam's mouth were were uh, transformed into other words. Uh, you know, not according to his will, but because God said, yeah, you know, you wanted to go that way, but it's going to change because we're going to bless this Because they're my people, and I won't, my I won't people. allow And that. of course, the, the, maybe I, you know, maybe it's too early to say in the show, but it's just like a, um, uh, I always forget the expression, Spoiler? Rabbi, uh, you know, in a movie, you know, I have a, uh, uh, the expression that reveals the end. Spoiler? A spoiler. Don't do a spoiler. A sp Mom, a spoiler is the beautiful line about uh, about how, how how goodly are your tents, O Israel. That uh, the final Jacob. attempt, uh, the final attempt by Bilam to curse Israel, he says, how goodly are your tents, Jacob. And uh, our sages teach us that. Your dwelling places, O Israel. Our sages teach us that the, the dwelling places, well, he could see everything because he was up in a high mountain. He saw the entire nation before him. And the tents were were arranged in a way so that everybody had their own space and their own privacy. And one, uh, the window from one tent didn't look directly into the other tent. And that was an expression of modesty, which which personified the entire nation. And it was that v'ahavtul riyach It was that aspect of loving your neighbor as yourself that gave Israel the iron dome. That gave Israel the the immunity to uh, to the potential curse so basically the idea is that um, this unholy alliance that we read about I as the parasha it's begins um, of evil. which was which was actually not only unholy it was actually unnatural because these are actually natural enemies that mm -hmm. were that were that joined together uh, out of their mutual loathing of uh, Israel well, that always happens can, when it comes to Israel it certainly seems to and you know you got to fast forward because we've been learning about the generation of the desert but this is actually already the generation that's going to be going into the yeah. land of Israel so they're poised and they're ready basically to bring about this tremendous tikkun rectification of all humanity that's what's going to happen when the people of Israel enter into the land and they rectify Adam HaRishon's banishment from Gan Eden they're going to go in. They're going to bring the light of God into the world. This is still the task of the Jewish people in the land of Israel to this very day. And so, you know, they tried a lot of things. They tried missiles. They tried bombs. They tried all sorts of things. Amalek came and waged war, all sorts of things. And, and all that seems to be left now is cursing. You have this fellow, Balak, who is an amazing man. He was tremendous in his spiritual stature. And, you know... Um, I want, and I want to mention this in um, this week's video teaching, God willing, uh, that we're going to have on Parshat Balak. I know it's the first original video we're going to have, we'll have had for a couple of weeks because while I was away speaking in America, I think you put up some previous years. Mm -hmm. um, so this year we're going to have a new Balak. And you know what, I, I want to talk a little bit about the fact that in the chapters of the Fathers, it mentions that... Um, there, one should one should be like the students of Avraham, let's say, and not the students of Balak, like of Bilam. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, of Bilam, right? In other words, Avraham had students, mm -hmm. and so did Bilam. So who are Bilam's students today? You know, and what what is what was Bilam's whole school of thought? Um, I certainly see a certain kind of um, anger management problem. He had a lot of. Um, hostility of, and a lot of um, hatred, a lot of mean spirit. But the thing is, you know what his whole thing is like, he 
wanted to manipulate God's anger as well. Like he boasted that he knew exactly how to manipulate God when he's angry, like at, for a fraction of a second. Mm -hmm. There's a certain fraction of a second which is like an impossible astronomical calculation on some sort of mystical level that God is angry, whatever that means. And he knew how to set the atomic clock to know exactly when that moment comes about. And I said, if I can just line up all the ducks right, mm -hmm. in a row and set up all the prisms so that the light is refracted perfectly at the moment of God's anger, I can give them this tremendous whammy. And of course, he, he wasn't successful. Is that why he squinted when he, when he tried to bless them? He squinted he was trying to you know, line sun? it up with the one eye, you know, like when you're sighting something in your, yeah. in your sights. So the thing is, well, you know, who was this man? Who was Bilam, this, this heathen, heathen, heathen prophet? He was such a um, anomaly and yeah. had so many contradictions. As we study what our sages tell us about him, that he, on the one hand, uh, was born with tremendous spiritual potential that could have been used towards holiness. In Strategy. fact, on one level, our sages tell us that he was very resentful because he thought that God should have chosen him to deliver Israel out of Egypt. Hmm. So he knew who God was. He absolutely was a was a was a oh, at least if not a fan, he was certainly aware of the God of Israel in his pantheon. Oh, okay. He had a lot of very special talents. In addition to this strange sort of spiritual power that he knew exactly how to manipulate God, whatever that means, if if it's literal, right? He was very glib, he was very wise, he was very um, articulate. He, his power was in his mouth. Uh, very Asavian, right? The mouth hunter. But I mean, his whole thing was, well, if, uh, if the children of Israel, if their power is through their mouths, right, with prayer, then I'm going to use my mouth as well and I'm going to line up and uh, I'm going to deliver all these curses. That was the idea of why Balak hired him, because it was known that whoever he curses really gets it. And so the thing is, though, that the, the, the sages are replete in their descriptions of Bilam that he was, um, he was very learned, he was also very religious, he was extremely pious. He even says a few times here, listen, I can't, you know, if what God tells me to do, I, I can't go against God. If you give me all the silver and gold in the world, I can't do anything that God doesn't tell me to do. So he had that cloak. He could run for president. And he, had a, he definitely had a political cloak, and he had a cloak of intelligentsia. Ooh, and of course, that translates for me as how we see so much of the anti-Semitism in the world, anti-Israelness and, and the Jew hatred is emanating from none other than the finest universities, the finest schools in the world is where all the professors all right. are lining up and bashing Israel, right? So, so the thing is, you have this, this fellow here, and he wants to open up his mouth and curse the Jews because nothing else seems to be working <laughs> to stop them, you know? It's like uh, the... The dip diplomatic warfare that's uh, being conducted against Israel today, you know, yes, the UNESCO, etc. Exactly, and I'm thinking about the fact that, you know, uh, as we go to Mike today, you know, there's a, a major development that uh, there are basically two resolutions that are um, slated for voting in UNESCO, and apparently there's some maneuvering going on. The Palestinians are trying to maneuver uh, um, the vote on the status of Jerusalem like very quickly, even though it was supposed to, it was supposed to wait until Friday. They're trying to blindside the Israeli diplomats because they were putting all their efforts into uh, dealing with the vote that's supposed to be coming up about um, the, sta the status of the city of Hebron, that the, U the UN wants to declare that Hebron, the first Jewish city, the city of Abraham, the city of the patriarchs, the city where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are buried. And the, the United Nations wants to declare that a place of Muslim heritage with no Jewish heritage whatsoever. So while Israel is trying to deal with that horrific thing to add insult to injury, comes along this effort now to apparently um, push ahead the resolution about Jerusalem and to what they call, and I'm putting my fingers in the air, making apostrophe marks, soften it in a way that the Palestinians think it will pass through without even having to be voted on. And that, and, and that of course, um, um, calls Israel the occupying power and, um, and criticizes Israel for um, archaeological work in the old city and says, and says that um, Israel's destroying and all this kind of stuff. And by the way, the resolution about Hebron is also saying that Hebron has to be listed as a Palestinian city which is in da in of, of, in danger of, of international, um, international historical importance, which is in being endangered by Israel, which is insane. 
So this is, yes, it's a very, very uh, apropos, timely, and in, in, in a, even in a chilling sense that this falls out in the Torah portion of, of Balak. And um, you know what? You read the Torah portion about, about Bilam and how, you know, he takes him to a high place and he sets up his offerings and he wa- is waiting for God to, to spe- speak to him and it doesn't work. And instead he utters, he utters these these words that he thought would be curses and they turn into these beautiful blessings and each time he says well i'll take you to another place maybe you'll be able to see better you know take you to a place where you can see the, the nation from up here from up here like they're standing up, up on a up on a hill up on a ridge looking down at the people yeah. and it, it seems to me like that that um the message here is like clear that he he's saying you know i can't quite put my finger on them i can't quite figure them out I can't quite see and understand what they're really all about. And he makes all these efforts to um, define them, to pin them down, to uh, articulate something that will hit them right where it counts. And he's not successful. He's not successful. And instead he blesses. So there's a lot of um, poignant meaning, um, I think, uh, in this of what's going on around us today. I say all this on the 4th of July as 201 North American immigrants move to Israel this very day. I say all this when we ponder the the global village and the role that Israel plays in the life of mankind and certainly in the life of the Jewish people. And I wonder uh, what the message is here for, for us right now. We also have the reverse phenomenon today which is uh, those world leaders who will, on the surface, be blessing Israel. I'm the best friend of Israel. We love Israel. Israel's wonderful. Israel's terrific. But we know that uh, behind the scenes they are uh, doing their best to undermine and, and uh, destroy Israel. So that's another uh, flip side of the Bilam, of the Bilam uh, phenomenon. Again, Bilam himself, he's very sincere. He's very smart. He's very, he's very um, accomplished. He's an intellectual. He's religious. He's, he's smooth. Is he vain? Is he vain? Oh, is he vain? He probably yeah, thinks he the probably thinks the song. Him. He probably thinks the song is all about him, right? Well, <clears throat> um, there's the music. So we'll be right back here on Temple Talk. Good to be back with you, Yitzhak Ruben. You're going to be here for the, for the second half with me, I have no plans of being abroad for the second half of Temple Talk, which should commence in seconds from now here in the holy city of Jerusalem. That is the capital, undivided, and one and eternal of the Jewish people. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Temple Talk. Shalom and welcome back to Temple Talk. This is Yitzchak Ruven with the beloved Rabbi Chaim Richman, your friend and mine here in Jerusalem, Israel. Today is the 10th day of the month of Tammuz, 5777. One week from today will be the 17th of Tammuz, the fast day uh, commemorating the breaching of the walls of Jerusalem by the Roman uh, occupiers and invaders which begins a three-week period of reflection and introspection and uh, taking on attributes of mourning, which reaches a crescendo and concludes with the ninth of Av, which is a 25-hour fast. And uh, we'll be talking about that. So we're actually going to have a Temple Talk program on yes. the fast day of the 17th you day will, of Tom. We'll be speaking week. without eating, if you think that's possible. Today is July 4th. 2017. Hey. It's uh, it's American Independence Day. What is it? Uh, 1776, and, t- and it's now 2017. That's 241 years. You're getting up there, America. Uh, and you know the beautiful thing about the state of Israel is that we're so young, yet we're so old because uh, the modern state of Israel is uh, 69 years old. 
uh, just like we're kids, but Israel, the nation, um, is thousands and thousands of years old. And in fact, this week's parsha, as we were explaining before, Parshat Balak uh, is the moment just before Israel enters into the land. It's that waiting period, I guess it's uh, in the final year or final years of the 40 years in the desert and the nation of Israel is perched just east of the Jordan River, uh, sort of opposite, I guess, Jericho, which is, will be the first city that Israel will conquer as we occupy our land. Yes, we do occupy our land. We are the occupiers. We're commanded to occupy and settle the land. And that's exactly what we've done. And, um, you know, we were sp saying, Rabbi, earlier that Balak was frantic. He seemed to be less concerned that he might lose a war with Israel than that Israel will enter into the land of Israel. He, uh, I mean, he was desperate to keep Israel east of the Jordan. And this is basically the question I was, you're foreshadowing, the question I was going to ask was like, why is this happening right now? You know, it's the end of the 40 years, and the children of Israel um, have um, um, transformed into the new young nation that's going to be taking possession of the land. And uh, Balak, the son of Tzipor, the king of Moab, is dredging up this stuff about uh, how they came out of Egypt, like, hello, <laughs> duh, like now you're saying, listen, behold, the people has come out of Egypt. Well, actually, that was years ago, wasn't it? It's right. covered the surface of the earth, and it sits opposite me. So now, please come and curse this people for me, for it is too powerful for me. You understand what, if what he do we had... do to you? We, do we threaten you? Israel, exactly. Israel had no intention to occupy Ooh, there are, there Balak's there land. Power. They weren't going to take over Moab. I will Moab. be able to strike it and drive it away from the land. For I know that whoever you bless is blessed, and whoever you curse is cursed. So he was concerned about one thing, and that is that they should not go into the land. And that's because the equation, balance of the people of Israel living in the land of Israel, according to the word of the God of Israel, spells disaster for people like Balak and Bilam and their ilk. And that's why he said, as you well know, that's why he said they're going to lick up our entire surroundings as an <laughs> ox licks up the greenery of the field. This is going to be our end because they're going to uproot us completely. But, but Israel wasn't going to uproot anybody. They were just going to uproot their idolatry. Well, let me ask you a question. Their evil, but they weren't going to physically uproot Look at the them. world now. Look at the world stage. Yes. Look at all the anti-Israel resolutions right. and all the, the lies and all of the attempts to uns unseat Israel and destroy it and drive it basically from the world. No different than they wanted to do. What did we do? Are we... Are we did we change the course of rivers? Did we pollute the moon and stars? What do we do exactly <laughs> that they need to, to do this? But you see, this is it exactly. It's just the very fact that we are here, whether it's because we are a reminder of what mankind is supposed to do, whether it's because we, are, we present some sort of a um, challenge. The fact is, this is exactly what the situation is. And, but I want to go further. I want to go further. And I want to suggest to you that it's because Bilam and Balak, they knew the power of the land of Israel mm -hmm. and that that power could only be harnessed and channeled and reflected properly as a, as a reflection of the honor of God in this world by the people of Israel. In the land of Israel. In the land of Israel. So in other words, this is an idea that they wanted to stop that from happening, the entrance of the people into the land, because they knew very well that this would bring about a state of blessing and enlightenment for the world. And they wanted the world to stay in accursed darkness. And that's, again, there's no change in the script here from many of the despotic and self-propelling um, tyrants that uh, dominate the world stage today. But I think this is intriguing, the idea of the sacredness of a place. When I think about the sacredness of the land of Israel, does Absolutely. everyone realize how sacred it is? Israel, the people, needs a land in which to dwell. 
Israel's a people, it's a community. It's not some kind of cosmopolitan international philosophy or religion or... Or vacation land. It's, 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 it's real. <laughs> Everything about Israel is real. It's, we're real people and we have a real Torah and we have a real land and that land is, is where God's presence is, is, is most accessible to us and is closest and that's it's our our power point on this earth and from there from Jerusalem goes forth Torah that's that's the whole deal where uh, but again I, I, I it's not so much in my opinion as it's a, as it is um, where we have direct access to God as much as it is a key in a lock it is you know like when you when you find that place in the in the movie and you touch the rock and everything turns and like it fits mm -hmm. in perfectly that's what this is it's a, it's a perfect combination to a higher level of consciousness for the world for out of zion shall go forth torah and the word of god from jerusalem when the people of israel are in the land of israel is bringing about this state of excellence to the whole world because the temple is built and the balance is perfected and the shechina dwells in the world and this is exactly what they want to stop. At all costs, and even at their own self-destruction, ultimately. And to give an, to give an, uh, I was going to give an example, Rabbi, of, uh, of how the curse can backfire on them. You know, this past year, we were talking before about the UNESCO resolutions, and this past year there were a number of resolutions about the Temple Mount. And um, Temple Mount has, doesn't belong to Israel, has nothing to do with Israel. There was never a temple there. It's all uh, Muslim this, Muslim that. Um, and this past week, there was a beautiful ceremony on the Temple Mount, a Jewish ceremony um, that was uh, exclusively Jewish and that was sanctioned by the, by the government of Israel uh, and that was a memorial service for a uh, Halel Ayafa Ariel, 14-year-old girl who was murdered in her home one year ago in Kiryat Arba. And last Thursday, there was a memorial service there, and the police actually closed the mount to Muslims throughout the duration of this couple of hours of this service. The police... Um, uh, how do you say, the police uh, brass uh, accompanied the parents of Halal Ariel and the over 150 people who went up and uh, accompanied them throughout and people were allowed to pray quietly and blessings were allowed to be made. Of course these things, this should be, not even have to be noted because it should be the natural thing, but it's not and these were exceptions. Uh, so my point is that, is that, yes, Rabbi and I and many others have been going up to the Temple Mount for years and shouting to whoever is going to listen that this has to be a place of prayer. That's what it's meant to be. This is the place that God chose for us to be and to pray. And but our government's not listening. But I think in the past year, when the uh, Bilams and Balaks of the world began cursing. Uh, this place and saying we have nothing to do with it. I think that a certain consciousness started to yes. enter into the thinking mm -hmm. of in our In general, leaders. there is a shift in the policy uh, outwardly even um, <coughs> that the police has been demonstrating towards the Jews. Um, it's been much more one of um, tolerance. I wouldn't exactly call it acquiescing. This was a very great exception. The, this was a big exception. The day that the Ariel family uh, went up uh, in, in the memorial of their daughter, there was a lot more cooperation then. But I'm saying in general, the police have made um, some market efforts to uh, uh, at least appear to be more humane, more understanding, more human, more more um, respectful of, of the Jews. Uh, still no outward prayer is allowed, no. But um, I think you're right. I think that one of the turning points, and, and, and you know, you and I have been, say, have been saying in the past, well, you know, it's maybe it's the new inspector general of the police, the police chief, maybe yeah, it's the, it has a lot, lot to do with the could, minister could, of internal security, who seems to be really yeah. uh, but, uh, a lot better. But also we do measure that from the time that 
the um, UNESCO people uh, targeted the Temple Mount, that made a very big change also in the position of the government. And, and, and I think uh, in the consciousness of many Israelis um, that, that uh, this is a holy place and uh, we can't take it lightly. And I think that Israel, uh, 2,000 years in the diaspora, you know, lost contact with its holy places and, and sort of they drifted from the forefront of consciousness. So that's really interesting that you say that because right now the Western Wall is at the center of a, okay, yeah. a, a, a type of um, intrigue or what is that word, imbroglio, <laughs> in terms of, uh, you know what I'm trying to say, in terms of uh, the relationship um, between Israel and diaspora Jewry. Um, and some of that has to do maybe with the fact that, well, does everyone really understand what it, what this place is? Now, uh, on my level of understanding, if I if I may say so, um, this is a little bit um, frustrating to me, and I, I consider it somewhat ironical because, I mean, in, with all due respect, and the Kotel is a, is a holy place, and it's um, and it should be considered thusly, but it isn't holy compared to the Temple Mount mm -hmm. at all. And you know, uh, we emphasize that in our teachings, writings, lessons. Every time we have the opportunity to clarify to people that, uh, you know, the Kotel, the Western Wall, is assumed by many people and touted to be the holiest place in Judaism. But that is simply uh, a mistake to say that. The Western Wall is hallowed by the prayers of our people for 2,000 years. But intrinsically speaking, the Western Wall is not a holy site. It is not the place of the of the Holy Temple, and it wasn't even a wall of the Holy Temple, period. It was a wall that was built for architectural, uh, structural purposes to, um, to uh, shore up, you know, to give, to give uh, support. On the western side of the massive landfill that was, um, that was part of the refurbishing of Herod in the Second Temple structure, but the holy place, the only holy place to the Jewish people in the world is what's on top. So I kind of sit back and look at this infighting between the different Jewish groups about who's on first at the Western Wall. And I, and I kind of say to myself, well, <laughs> you know, this is not really the place anyway right. to tell you the truth. Like, you can fight over it all you want, but if you were serious about making a statement for the God of Israel, it's n you're on the wrong floor. Right. Yes. On the other hand, it's a beautiful thing that this sense of attachment to place, which many people will think, oh, that's primitive or that, you know, nobody does that anymore. And uh, that's like a throwback. And, and what could possibly be holy about a place? I mean, it's just a thing. But actually, the idea of uh, attachment to a place or a place being holy, one place more than another place, is a sacred kind of geometry. And I believe if you would study, you probably have, Yitzchak, because you're very well read and well rounded. I believe that it is central to the beliefs of many people in this world. It certainly is central to the beliefs of, of many native peoples around the world, and, and uh, certainly first and foremost Native Americans, uh, Indian tribes in America each have their holy, holy places, which are holy because, because it's God's gift to them, because God said, I, this is for you, this is for you, this is where you and I are closest. And yes, many beautiful things happen in those holy places as a result of its intrinsic holiness. Again, people may be confused. They may say, well, the, the, the Temple Mount's holy because there was a temple there. No, the temple was built there because it's a holy right. place. Exactly. We are taught that the Temple Mount is intrinsically holy and it was sanctified by God since the beginning and even before the beginning of creation. In fact, it was the birthplace of Adam HaRishon, of the first man. In fact, it's the center of the universe. It's the navel of creation. And, you know, we, we maintain, I think people relate much more easily to the sacredness of time. You know, the idea of Shabbat is something that people can experience and then, you know, it begins to, to, to grow on you and, and you get into it and it, it surrounds you and it's a living experience. It's a little more difficult when you are so detached and distant from your holy place, which is why as long as Jews have only limited hours on the Temple Mount, as long as Jews aren't allowed to pray in the Temple Mount, it's very difficult to, to rekindle that connection. Yet, that's exactly what we work so hard to do, and slowly, slowly it's happening. And so, if people want to, if the Jews of the world want to have an, you know, a, a squabble about, about praying 
at, at the Western Wall, I say, well, there is a lot of good in that because it means something is starting to awaken in people who the idea of any holiness attached to a location was, was dormant for so many years. It never dies. It's dormant. And it's beginning to awaken. So, you know, our task, Rabbi, is to take this and 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 try to guide it and direct it to to the right place. And this and fits in very, very much with, with Parshat Balak because again, this is this is uh, a last ditch effort by these evil powers to try and prevent the people of Israel from coming into the land because they knew the powerful combination that that would be for the world. And again, fast forward to 2017 and more UNESCO resolutions not recognizing any Jewish connection whatsoever to the city of Jerusalem or to the city of Hebron where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are buried. And this is the theater of the absurd, but this is the same technique. It is the big lie. It is one big curse. And um, it doesn't work because the people are blessed. It doesn't work and it always backfires. You probably wanted to say something about the end of the Torah portion. Ooh, the end of the Torah portion. Well, that's something that we, if we're going to put everything into the present, it's something that we have to be very, very careful of because it's Let's so... sum it up for us very quickly. At the end, uh, after Bilam goes his way and Balak goes his way, uh, Bilam actually left Balak he left, with he one, says, I'll give you a little of, advice. one final word of advice. Yeah, he says, I'll give you a little advice, and it's not really stated. I mean, when he, he saw then, that my, my thing, my cursing isn't going to work. Right. And at the end uh, of the parasha, the sons of Israel are seduced by the daughters of the Midianites. And that oh. creates, I think it's the Benot Midian, isn't it? And that creates a crisis, naturally. And... Uh, it creates a crisis in the people because there's this uh, abandon. And who, is it the Midianites or the Moabites? Moab. Moab? And um, it was actually a, a um, subterfuge to, to um, cause them to worship the To cause the Israel to, to anger God, and, uh, and then God's wrath will be on Israel. And of course, it created a crisis in the people, and it also created a a momentary crisis in the leadership because there was a sort of a uh, a moment where it seemed that everybody was the leadership was sort of looking at one another. Well, the saying, ends in the crescendo of of one man who, who did bring a Midianite woman, right? And um, it was a disaster, and the leadership was weeping at the entrance of the tents of meeting. And then one person came along who was the grandson of Aaron, who was Pinchas, right. son of Elazar, and he. He uh, did those sinners in. How's that? He skewed them. Skewered them. Yes. He skewered two people. Yeah, you all know the story. It's not pretty, but it was effective. And there's much more to say about Pinchas next week. In fact, next week's Parsha is named after Pinchas. Yes, can I, can I make an important announcement? Yes, please. Important announcement. I'm giving a very big heads up here on something that, uh, of which the details will be following um, very soon. But for those of you who would like to save the dates, very early bird heads up. We are pleased to announce that we will be having a Temple Research Conference in the Lone Star State of Texas between the dates of November 9th and November 12th. We're going to be having a very exciting Temple Research Conference, the first of its kind. I think it might even be called the West Texas Temple Research Conference because it's going to be held in the fair and flat city of Lubbock. They're going to say fabled city. And it's going to be an amazing event with lessons and segments on both the spiritual and physical aspects of the temple as well as a special appearance by one of Israel's leading archaeologists responsible for many uh, discoveries of Temple Mount artifacts. Whoa. It's going to be a very, very special event. We hope to see you there. We're going to be advertising it in our social media, and um, some written material is going to be sent out also. If you want more information about it, please write to us. You've got to save the dates of November 9th through and including the 12th for the first 
And you won't know the first West Texas Temple Research Conference. Sounds exciting, Rabbi. And in fact, I think my friend Yitzhak Ruvain is going to be there. Really? Yes. Wow. This is, this is, this is going to be the chance of a lifetime to get an autographed glossy of Yitzhak Ruvain himself, who's going to be speaking. Uh, as far as I know, he I actually is going to be presenting several, several beautiful lessons at the West Texas several? Temple Research Conference, Yikes. November 9th through 12th. Yeah, I hope you just didn't kill it for everybody, Rabbi. Regardless of, of, of Yitzhak Ruven, you use as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. You don't want to pass this up. 9th through 12th, November. Yes. Mark it in your calendar and... Uh, Still early and we will let you know all about it. And... There's the music. You hear music? I'm not hearing music, am I? Because you're not wearing your headphones. I'm not even seeing music. Anyway, it's been great. Here's the music, and thanks for being with us, Temple Talk.